start. So hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this week's lecture and planning series presentation. Our speaker today is one of our own GSAP colleagues, Michael Snydel, PhD candidate in urban planning here at Columbia's urban planning program. My name is Maureen Abihanam, and I am too a PhD student here at the program, and I'll be moderating the session. I will start with a brief logistical uh, announcement and then introduce our speaker. During the talk, I'd like to remind members to please mute their microphones. We will be recording today's lecture, so anyone in the audience who wishes to not be recorded should turn off their camera. The chat box should be used only for discussion regarding the session. So if you have any technical questions that apply only to you, please message me or my co-host, Joe Hennekins, directly. After the presentation, we will have time for Q&A. We'll start around 2 or 2.15 to have enough time for everyone's questions. And we encourage you all to participate. I will be coordinating the Q&A with attention to diversity and inclusion. So if you've already had a chance to ask your question, please allow others to do so before asking another one. And to ask questions, you have two options. Participants can either uh, use the raise the hand, raise your hand feature in Zoom, and we will call on you to unmute and ask uh, your question directly. Or you may also type your questions in the chat box as the presentation goes along and I can read them out. So with that, I'm delighted to now turn to introducing today's speaker. Michael Snydel is a doctoral candidate in urban planning here at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Snydel is also principal of Snydel Real Estate, a Baltimore-based construction and property management firm. He was formerly the director of neighborhood development of West Baltimore at the Baltimore Development Corporation. His work has been featured in academic and popular news sources, such as the Washington Post, the Financial Times, and the Baltimore Sun. Today, Michael's lecture entitled, Missed Opportunity, the West Baltimore Opportunity Zone Story, explores opportunity zones that were established by the Tax Cuts and Job Acts of 2017. This represents the federal government's largest commitment to place-based investment in decades. Michael questions the early evidence of its effect and presents finding from 76 interviews with community and government officials, program managers, developers, businesses, and fund managers about opportunity zones economic development outcomes in West Baltimore. Michael concludes with a set of short-term policy recommendations and discusses the broader policy framework that is necessary to attract durable and equitable investment into highly distressed neighborhoods. I'm sure it will be a bracing and insightful talk. So with that, Michael, if you're ready, I'll pass things over to you now. I'm ready, you can see my slides? Yeah. Great. Well. Uh... Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Maureen, and thanks so much for having me. Uh, hi, everyone. As Maureen mentioned, I'm Michael Snydel, and uh, I'm a doctoral candidate at Columbia. Uh, and I was a master's student in this program, uh, so this is a particular honor for me. Um, I've seen some really good uh, research presented at LIPS over the years uh, and by some really impressive people. Uh, and those lectures have definitely shaped the way I not only think about research, but the way I thought about research on this project. Um, and I know firsthand how helpful urban planning students with, with your diversity of credentials and experiences uh, can be in, in informing research and asking those sharp and critical questions. So this is uh, truly exciting for me. Uh, so today I'm gonna present on a project that I've been working on over the last year and a half. Um, it's part of my dissertation, uh, and it's part of a multi-pronged examination of the Federal Opportunity Zones policy. And today I'm, I'm going to focus on just one face of that project that is now complete, uh, which is a baseline qualitative evaluation uh, of the policy in very distressed neighborhoods of West Baltimore. But I'm, I'm going to try to touch on uh, the other pieces and how they all fit together along the way. Uh, and so I'm just going to hop into it, and, and Maureen, I hope you'll let me know if something in the chat box is, is timely, and, and we can go back to it. Okay, so, so for optimism's sake, let's say I'm halfway through this uh, three-pronged research agenda. And those three prongs, hopefully three papers, uh, are the following. The first is an in-depth qualitative evaluation of OZ policy uh, in the very distressed neighborhoods of West Baltimore. Uh, and again, this is a piece of the pie which is uh, basically com complete. 
Uh, it was supported by a research seed grant through Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and I expect it will be published in Cityscape, uh, the journal this summer. Uh, and I should mention that I'm beyond uh, grateful to Johns Hopkins 21st Century Cities Initiative, as well as my grant partner, Dr. Sandra Newman. Uh, without them, this research definitely would not have been possible. Just quickly, the other faces of the agenda uh, include an early quantitative evaluation of OZ policy. Uh, this replicates some of the more compelling uh, econometric assessments of OZ's predecessor state and federal enterprise zones. I'll talk about those a little shortly. Uh, and specifically, this paper looks at lending outcomes between OZ and non-OZ tracks, carefully uh, establishing a counterfactual using a propensity score matching technique. Uh, the final piece I, off, I refer to as a, a theoretical investigation of OZ, and this research really traces the etymology and the intellectual history of OZ, uh, in order to explore what I think is a under-theorized and misunderstood question, uh, which is why tax preferences for economic development continue to be advanced uh, without robust literature supporting their effectiveness. Um, so first, I want to give you a quick overview of Opportunity Zones policy. And I should uh, note that when I first presented uh, this research, um, I and anyone kind of looking at OZ uh, really described the policy as hidden uh, or tucked into the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, but Opportunity Zones have since then become front and center and really fully politicized uh, in popular news coverage uh, and in Washington. And I imagine uh, that many, if not all of you, have at least had uh, some sort of cursory read on OZ by now. Uh, in the media, it's been the, the regular target of left-leaning news organizations as a prime example of corporate abuse and waste. Uh, under the Trump administration. Uh, so for example, Paul Krugman has labeled this policy as part of the great tax break heist. Uh, and if you watched the presidential debates last fall, uh, you may have seen that Donald Trump uh, actually made OZ the central talking point of what his administration was doing around racial inequality in America. Um, and in fact, you know, Ben Carson, the former Johns Hopkins based neurosurgeon who uh, has, has just served as HUD secretary in the Trump administration is still kind of meandering around right wing news outlets uh, talking about the effectiveness of OZ. Uh, and, and based on uh, what I'd say are some pretty fudgy numbers uh, put out by the White House last fall um, by the Council of Economic Advisors, um, he claims it's inspired 75 billion in investment, uh, that it's produced 500,000 jobs. Uh, and then it's lifted a million people out of poverty. Uh, so, so I'm not going to break down uh, how problematic those White House numbers probably are, but, um, but I think there's good reason that attention continues to be given to this policy. Uh, and I think there's good reason for the skepticism as well. Uh, first, the Biden administration uh, seems poised to keep OZ policy, uh, which while um, you know, the Trump administration really seized as their own policy. It was actually concocted under the Obama administration. Uh, and in Congress, it remains highly popular bipartisan policy. Uh, second, according to Congress's Joint Finance Committee, uh, OZ is expected to cost the US government about $1.5 billion a year uh, between now and 2026 in foregone tax revenue. Uh, now, later in this talk, I'm going to try to convince you that this is not actually that much money for neighborhood transformation. Uh, but nonetheless, if these estimates are correct, uh, they mean that OZ will trump not only the Clinton era empowerment zones, but also the great society programs that we as planners and policymakers are repeatedly told were so expensive and so vast. Um, and I think attention is, of course, justified because OZ, uh, at least ostensibly, is meant to troubleshoot one of uh, the biggest threats to the American economy. Uh, and the American dream, inequality. Uh, so, so here's a graph you're all probably quite familiar with at this point. It's the Thomas Piketty's work that upends the Kuznets curve theory. Uh, and specifically, uh, OZ was stated to address the spatial manifestations of inequality across American neighborhoods. Um, so another analysis you're probably all quite familiar with at this point, given uh, the press around Raj Chetty's work on income mobility, uh, we know economic mobility varies greatly by where you grow up. Uh, we know that a child growing up in Baltimore City, where this study takes place, is predicted to make almost $4,500 less per year uh, than if they grew up in an average jurisdiction. 
Uh, and yet we could all get together, hop in a van and drive 40 minutes from Baltimore City and go to the wealthy uh, suburb of DC, Montgomery County. And that same child would be expected to make $3,000 more uh, than the average jurisdiction. Uh, and, and indeed, opportunity zones were pitched from both sides of the political aisle as an opportunity to bring capital and economic development um, to communities in areas of unequal development, uh, particularly those that had not rebounded from the Great Recession. And the notion of the policy was really threefold. It was that, it was that uneven distribution of capital deployment explains neighborhood inequality, uh, that deployment of this capital must be made by private actors, uh, and that the only role for the federal government is to reduce barriers, in this case, uh, capital gains taxes, so that this private uh, capital and equity can flow to where it hasn't previously. Uh, and again, most importantly, whether you, you know, read congressional testimony, whether you examine expert support, the sales pitch for all of this uh, was that the businesses and residents of distressed uh, communities would be the beneficiaries. So um, opportunity zones should therefore represent economically distressed areas. Uh, now in reality, 57% of all census tracts in America qualified to be opportunity zones based on their poverty and income demographics. Uh, the final designations you can see uh, uh, here, they represent the over 8,700 census tracts that were nominated by every governor and, a true, and approved by the treasury. And, and just to give you a few examples of designated opportunity zones, you can really see they run the gamut of location, uh, of neighborhood type, and of level of distress. Uh, so they include the highly distressed Pennsylvania Avenue in West Baltimore, where the Freddie Gray riots were centered and where this study takes place. Uh, they include the historically distressed but recently gentrifying Woodlawn, Chicago, uh, which is next to the University of Chicago and the future Obama Presidential Library. Uh, they include the arguably not distressed site in Long Island City that Amazon decided not to establish an HQ2 at. Um, they include rural sites like the old Moran coal plant in Burlington, Virginia, uh, undeveloped retail waterfront of the once bankrupt and still recovering from the foreclosure crisis Stockton, uh, and even the entire USC college campus is in OZ, uh, which, you know, that area certainly has a high poverty rate, but it also, uh, as we know, has a massive student base whose lack of income uh, supports uh, such a designation. Um, and, and if you followed uh, OZ in Baltimore when I uh, began this research, one of the early criticisms of the policy was that while the city had actually picked highly distressed tracks um, for OZ designation, uh, because of a computer error, the governor actually later added a mega development industrial site that was being developed for Under Armour's new headquarters uh, on a waterfront piece of land known as Fort Covington. And, um, you know, according to analysis by both the Brookings Institution and the Urban Institute, uh, some states clearly selected gentrified areas uh, where access to capital uh, was already abundant. Um, so, you know, if we think about it, this broad and disparate geographic targeting may direct capital towards gentrifying neighborhoods that didn't need subsidy, uh, and it may direct capital away from those highly distressed neighborhoods uh, that are likely to be deemed higher risk investments. Um, but it, it's not just the broad zone selection that calls into question whether distressed communities will benefit. It's also the, um, the rules and regulations. So someone who lives in a distressed community can't just receive subsidy by putting their equity um, into a property or business that falls into one of these zones. Uh, rather, to reap the benefits, uh, you need to have capital gains, and then you need to place those capital gains into something called a qualified opportunity fund. Uh, that's, that's really just a federally approved corporation or partnership that looks like a real estate investment trust uh, that invests in opportunity zones. Uh, and apart from the exclusion of a few SIN businesses, the activities that um, these QOFs can finance are, are really quite broad. They can finance commercial real estate, uh, industrial development, uh, infrastructure, uh, affordable housing, uh, but at the same time, they can also finance luxury residential and hotel development. Um, so here are just two quick examples of larger nationwide opportunity funds. Uh, on the left is Skybridge Capital Opportunity Fund. Uh, this one's actually the brainchild of uh, one-time White House Communications Director, Anthony Scaramucci. Um, uh, this fund originally planned to raise about $3 billion for uh, zones across the country. I, I think they're quite far from that mark. Uh, and on the right is the Fundrise Opportunity Fund, which some of you may know from the tech startup uh, known for real estate crowdfunding, uh, Fundrise. 
Uh, and the minimum capital gains investment to invest in Fundrise, for example, is $25,000. Now, I, I just want to give you a quick rundown of the benefits. The program basically lets investors avoid the typical tax on capital gains by putting these gains into funds, uh, which then invest in buildings and properties in opportunity zones. And every year the investment is held in the fund, capital gains taxes can be deferred. Uh, but if, if investors keep their investments uh, in those funds for five years or longer, uh, investors actually get a 10% reduction on the capital gains taxes. Uh, at year seven, this becomes 15%. Uh, and the real kicker uh, of the policy is that if investments are held for 10 years, that is they act as patient capital, uh, investors also pay no capital gains investments uh, that are made from the OZ. Uh, so, you know, maybe for those of you familiar with 1031 exchanges, this looks a lot like a place-based 1031 on steroids, right? Um, and, and if we all were to just kind of sit back and, and think about this for all the few seconds, we'd, we'd notice the tax benefits are pretty limited, right? They're limited to investors with pre-existing capital gains uh, or investors who expect to uh, face uh, future capital gains taxes in the next 10 years, uh, seven now. Um, so in other words, you know, very few Americans qualify for such a tax reduction opportunity. Uh, in fact, according to the Federal Reserve Board, only 18% of uh, American households actually report unrealized taxable capital gains. Uh, and the median capital gains among those who do is just $5,000. Now recall at Fundrise, the floor investment is $25,000. Um, so, so you know, and there was, there was just no indication that regulations would prevent investors uh, from receiving subsidy for investing in projects that would have gone forward uh, regardless of OZ. Uh, and critical press coverage of early OZ projects uh, created quite a stir. Uh, it included a spa for pets in Northern Miami, um, a Virgin Hotel in the warehouse district of New Orleans. Uh, and in the case of Baltimore, when I was first um, Beginning this research, the uh, the first project was an already planned shopping center next to Johns Hopkins uh, Bayview campus, which is a good uh, neighborhood uh, amenity project, but also a far cry from kind of uh, uh, development in truly distressed neighborhoods of East or West Baltimore. And, and we really only uh, knew this because of secondary and voluntary reporting and analysis. Um, the full extent of investments in opportunity zones over the past three years and perhaps going forward uh, may never be fully known. Uh, there is no federal requirement for detailed reporting. Uh, there is no public record that accurately sums up the capital expended. Uh, and the program requires no accounting of which communities have received OZ capital uh, or documentation of the types of projects being funded. Um, so, so on this note, I'm going to pivot a bit um, with that kind of introduction to OZ. You know, OZ is obviously a new policy, uh, and this is one of the first studies on its effects. Uh, and indeed, outside of these few studies, um, and in light of this kind of failure to implement robust reporting standards, uh, most of what we have is kind of anecdotal evidence in New York Times reporting uh, and elsewhere uh, that discuss concerns around program design uh, that I've just described to you. Um, however, we, we have actually been studying the idea of OZ, uh, I'd say since at least the mid-1980s. And that idea, if you trace the intellectual origins of tax preferences for place-based development, uh, actually, ironically, stems from a member of the Fabian Society, a later a Labor Party member, uh, and one of the most influential promoters and advocates of planning, uh, Sir Peter Hall. Uh, and in 1977, Hall made a pretty frustrated uh, and radical proposal for free ports. And, and the idea of free ports was that a small set of inner city neighborhoods would be self-selected for an experiment in free enterprise, where exchange controls, uh, custom duties, uh, and taxes be removed, uh, and that there be free movement of labor and capital into these uh, zones. Uh, and, and I should note that, that Hall was also at pains to point out that he was never recommending uh, free ports uh, as a panacea to urban problems, but was offering it as an extreme model of a possible solution. And it's this proposal for free ports that actually resulted in 24 enterprise zones in the United Kingdom under the Thatcher government. Uh, the most famous uh, you probably know is the London Docklands. 
Um, and by the early 1980s, as many of you probably know as well, the US uh, states also began implementing enterprise zones that were offering tax incentives uh, and employment credits for investment and job creation in targeted and distressed areas. Uh, by 1993, 40 states claimed an enterprise zone program, uh, and the federal government actually followed suit uh, and established the Federal Empowerment Zones Program. Uh, both are often referred to as EZ. Uh, and this was a combination of tax credits, but also direct grants, bonding authority, uh, and other benefits eligible in distressed urban and rural communities. Uh, and, and it's these programs and the New Markets Tax Credit Program that flowed from them uh, that are really the direct predecessors of OZ. Uh, and, and I'm not suggesting that these are the same programs um, as each other or as opportunity zones. Indeed, as I mentioned, the enterprise, the empowerment zones program at the federal level uh, had direct grants for social services uh, and also direct tax credits for hiring people who reside in the neighborhood. Um, but I am suggesting that opportunity zones are the most recent spin on what has now been 40 years of using the market as the framework which place-based policies are made understood uh, and implemented. And so, so with that kind of truncated history in mind and in thinking about how to conduct an evaluation of opportunity zones, it's important to note that we've had no shortage of studies on enterprise zones and empowerment zones, uh, both in the US and in other countries. Uh, in fact, you know, if you trace the literature, there have been over 50 peer reviewed studies on easy type programs in the US. moving myself there a little. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and the methodologies to evaluate the efficacy and the efficiency of EZ have really evolved um, repeatedly uh, over time. They start with descriptive studies, uh, turn towards survey-based regressions, uh, and more recently we've had, we've had complex quasi-experimental designs that carefully select control groups and use econometric techniques that mitigate for issues around selection bias uh, and ask that question, you know, what would have happened without the OZ here? Uh, and, and to briefly uh, summarize these, uh, these studies in two sentences, uh, I'd say that although some uh, econometric modeling does find uh, at least temporary benefits from EZ programs, uh, the more sophisticated studies and those with more convincing uh, counterfactuals tend to actually find EZ has had a nominal effect on employment or business growth. Uh, and I'd say given 30 years of studies, given the sophistication and development of these studies and the methods employed, and given the inconclusive and underwhelming findings, uh, it's at least safe to conclude that EASY has been ineffective as a catch-all policy uh, to arrest or reverse urban decline. Uh, but I, I'd say the more important finding when you go back through that literature is that um, studies on EZ have relied almost exclusively on quantitative designs. And over time, the primary and often sole agenda of these studies has been to properly establish that counterfactual. Um, and, and while there's no doubt that a, that, you know, a focus on refining econometric methods to meet this goal has been critically important, uh, in fact, it, it upended um, you know, early positive findings in support of EZ. Uh, and, and future studies on tax preferences uh, uh, for economic development, just like this one, you know, must carefully incorporate a counterfactual into their design. Uh, however, this kind of dog-minded focus on quantitative technique uh, has really left examinations of how and why these programs are or possibly are not working uh, by the wayside. Uh, there's a dearth of analysis on how to improve the programs uh, studies have become irrelevant to economic development practice, and, and, um, and as we see with OZ, um, it, it, this continues to be embraced and expanded um, for economic development, even in the face of lackluster uh, results. Uh, so in other words, easy studies have failed to directly document program design and implementation, uh, and they have failed to inform policy. And this is the real impetus for the qualitative evaluation of the program in Baltimore. Um, perhaps nothing uh, better emphasizes these points uh, than this quote from Jared Bernstein uh, in the very white paper that actually launched the OZ policy movement. Uh, and this kind of disconnect brings me to just briefly mention uh, the third part of this project, and then I'll hop us back over to Baltimore and the qualitative study. Um, so, Well, there's a, you know, a robust literature evaluating the efficacy of EZ, 
which again, Jared Bernstein reminds us is rather inconclusive. Relatively little has actually been written on why tax preferences uh, for place-based development like Easy and OZ continue to expand and grow without robust empirical support of their effectiveness. Uh, indeed, many of the evaluation studies actually acknowledge that findings have been ignored by policymakers and politicians. And so the last part of this project really traces the writings on economic development, on tax incentives, uh, on urban governance, uh, which together advance several overlapping and competing theories to help explain why programs like EASY initially proliferated between and amongst localities uh, in a devolved governance context. Uh, and, and in brief, I argue that these existing theories are pretty inadequate in explaining why tax preferences for economic development uh, continue to be proposed and implemented, uh, and why with the introduction of a policy like OZ, they've actually now become the modus operandi for not just local, but for federal place-based policy. Uh, and I suggest a more promising theoretical lens to understand the proposal, the design, uh, and the implementation of EZ and OZ programs, uh, as well as this transition from local EZ to federal EZ, uh, now finally to federal OZ, uh, is better found in the intersection of kind of neoliberal and ideational arguments. Um, but but I'll again I'll stop at that part of the project and I'll move us back to Baltimore uh, and the qualitative evaluation. Uh, so so this qualitative evaluation takes place in Baltimore City, uh, and for those of you who don't know Baltimore, uh, Baltimore is a majority black port city uh, that sits just north of Washington D.C. on the heavily populated and rather prosperous I-95 uh, or Acela corridor. Uh, and in 1950, uh, Baltimore had just short of a million res uh, residents. It was the sixth largest city in the United States. Um, but it has suffered from deep population loss. Uh, as of today, it is not even in the top 30 most populated cities in the country. Um, and the city is also plagued by poverty, by local corruption, uh, and by violence. In fact, among big US cities, uh, only St. Louis had a higher per capita murder rate in 2019. Uh, and Baltimore is also a hyper-segregated city. Uh, because of hundreds of years of racist policies and practices, uh, Baltimore's neighborhoods experience really radical different realities. Uh, so due to this uh, dynamic, white neighborhoods are actually now referred to uh, after their shape, an L of, predomin of predominantly white neighborhoods, which have structured advantages, while majority black neighborhoods are defined by their disadvantages and are frequently referred to locally as the black butterfly. Uh, and in 2015, uh, some of you may remember, the city drew attention nationwide uh, when riots broke out after Freddie Gray, a 25-year-old Black man, uh, died uh, a week after suffering a spinal injury while he was being transported in a police van without a seatbelt, uh, his hands and ankles uh, shackled, uh, so he was unable to protect himself. Uh, and, and Gray's death uh, triggered protests that were a precursor to uh, the current nationwide protests over racial injustice and people of color uh, being killed or injured by the police. Um, but in 2015, uh, the response from basically all levels of government, including the Obama administration, uh, was basically to look away and move on. Uh, in fact, uh, two months after the uprising uh, in Baltimore, the governor of Maryland actually canceled a $3 billion uh, uh, a three billion dollar transit infrastructure project, uh, which would have actually and had, which had a billion dollars from the feds, I should say, uh, which would have actually connected uh, some of the very same neighborhoods of Baltimore where Freddie Gray was murdered uh, uh, and the riots erupted to job centers both in the city uh, and the region. And and yet I should just mention that at the same time, Baltimore does not uh, perfectly fit the typical kind of American uh, Rust Belt town narrative. Uh, unlike many of those towns, it sits in a region that is booming uh, and in Maryland, which is one of the wealthiest states in the country. Uh, it is less than an hour drive to the nation's capital. Uh, Baltimore has long positioned itself uh, and been described as kind of the definitional entrepreneurial city. Uh, it was well known for homesteading. Uh, it was known for the adaptive reuse of its inner harbor, uh, which was inspiration for projects like the um, aforementioned London Docklands, uh, but also, you know, New York South Street Seaport was modeled after it. Um, and, um, and, and the port of Baltimore remains home to one of the busiest cargo ports in the nation. 
Uh, and the city uh, itself is home to a world-class university and medical system, uh, including perhaps the most well-known institution in the global fight against COVID-19, uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, so in many ways, it is kind of exactly the type of place uh, that opportunity zones, we were told, uh, should help. Um, so, so this qualitative evaluation area is the, uh, is the West Baltimore Opportunity Zones Cluster, the WBOZC. Uh, I, I may just refer to it as the case study for my, for my tongue's sake. Um, and, and I selected the case study for several reasons. Um, first, as you can see, the study area represents highly distressed neighborhoods uh, that can serve as a black swan for analysis. And I can explain a little more by what I mean uh, at the end if we have time for that. Um, second is I had detailed knowledge of economic and community development experts and projects in West Baltimore. Uh, I have a real estate and construction practice uh, in Baltimore, which Maureen mentioned. Uh, and uh, I was working as the director for West Baltimore for the Baltimore Development Corporation before I came back to pursue this research. Um, third, I would say that Baltimore's proximity uh, just generally to DC offered this unique advantage that I could identify and interview participants knowledgeable <clears throat> of both Baltimore and national OZ activity. Uh, and finally, unlike most um, jurisdictions, Baltimore and, and Maryland actually, uh, both established staff positions to work specifically as OZ program coordinators. And so these people uh, were, you know, obviously strong points of contact and informants for this study. Okay, so, so I conducted roughly 75 interviews with community and government officials, program managers, uh, developers, businesses, uh, and fund managers, uh, among others, as you can see. These were open-ended and semi-structured interviews. Um, and I used them to document and analyze how much new capital OZ had attracted to West Baltimore, uh, to document specific real estate and small business projects being supported by OZ, uh, you know, to ask that question, who is benefiting from OZ, uh, but also to ask what types of tools and incentives are necessary to attract capital uh, and economic development to uh, distressed neighborhoods. And, uh, and the takeaway of the findings is really in the title of the lecture here. Uh, OZ is a missed opportunity. Um, you know, I found that OZ is supporting some very positive development, uh, including investments in transit-oriented development, uh, expansion for a minority-owned business, uh, workforce housing, uh, even the attraction of high-paying tech jobs. Uh, and OZ is also uh, stimulating investment conversations and local government capacity. Uh, however, the policy is failing at oversight and engagement, uh, and I find it is actually not changing development outcomes. Uh, OZ is a weak incentive for capital gains investors who generally want market rate returns, uh, and it's a missed opportunity because it does not sufficiently support developers, uh, investors, institutions, uh, and businesses that are already active uh, in these distressed neighborhoods. Uh, and, and, what, and what the participant um, interviews really revealed is a locality doing its best with a tax policy that frankly was poorly designed to stimulate development in distressed neighborhoods. Okay, so uh, there, there's a lot of data, perhaps too much data on this slide, but I, I'm gonna uh, walk through each of most of these projects individually. So as of the end of 2020, no OZ deals had, um, had closed within the case study area, the WBOZC. Uh, however, I did document six completed OZ investments in Baltimore City uh, and another three projects that were likely to receive funding soon. Uh, and two of those three were actually in uh, the case study area. And again, these projects show how OZ investments are supporting um, some really important economic development work. Uh, so they include a $10 million investment in the transit um, oriented and major redevelopment of Baltimore's Penn Station. Uh, this investment is being made by a group called Blueprint Local. Blueprint is a national mission-driven fund uh, that uh, the study participants described as uniquely dedicated to community impact and engagement. Um, they include a roughly $1 million investment, this made by the Verte Opportunity Fund, a fund focused on impact venture capital. Uh, this investment was made into a operating business, Galen Robotics. Uh, which specializes in computational sensing and robotics. Uh, and this investment was actually part of Galen's permanent relocation into 5,000 square feet 
of an industrial uh, office space in Southwest Baltimore. Uh, they also include another roughly $1 million investment, again by Verte. Uh, this was made into a company called the Outlook Company, which is a full service animation studio. Uh, interestingly, this was a studio that was founded by Trevor Price, who was a former football player for uh, Baltimore, for the Baltimore Ravens, Baltimore's football team. Uh, and as part of this investment, uh, the Outlook Company is actually expanding in a move to the Hohen Lithograph Building in East Baltimore. Uh, and this development, I should mention, the new Hohen Building, is not an, is not an OZ project, uh, but it is a recent $30 million redevelopment in a truly distressed neighborhood that was made by um, Bill Struver's Cross Street Partners. Uh, and, the, and the forthcoming investments include a gap equity investment for affordable housing and retail space for local businesses in a truly distressed tract in the study area. Uh, and I should note the recipient of this investment is a developer that describes their company as um, racial and economic uh, justice driven uh, and that has the stated goal of undoing redlining. Uh, and forthcoming investments also include an estimated $10 million investment in a long planned uh, $100 million mixed use redevelopment project on the edge of the WBOZC. Uh, and this project, I should note, is being redeveloped um, uh, by one of the region's uh, most well known and most sophisticated uh, developers, MCB Real Estate. And this was a firm that actually uh, has deep and personal ties to West Baltimore. Now, um, far and away, the largest OZ investment, uh, current or forthcoming in Baltimore City, uh, this represents 65% of all OZ capital flowing in Baltimore City, according to my estimates, uh, is being invested by Goldman Sachs uh, into the, um, the 5.5 billion future headquarters of Under Armour. Uh, and this is most likely substitute capital for an already planned roughly 1 million square foot mixed use mega development at Port Covington. Um, so, outside of this $154 million at Port Cummington, uh, these projects combined represent about $78 million of OZ equity that's supporting real estate and business development projects that are, you know, benefiting residents across Baltimore City at large. Uh, however, it's important to note that investments in deeply distressed neighborhoods uh, rep represent less than 5% of total OZ equity deployed or expected to be deployed in Baltimore City. And you know, if, if we think about this in terms of neighborhood redevelopment uh, and in terms of the Baltimore economy even, uh, this is just not actually that much capital. Um, for example, if we again take Port Covington out of the mix, uh, OZ investment to date is about half the amount spent constructing uh, 414 Light Street. That's just a single 44 story luxury tower. That's uh, the newest addition to Baltimore skyline. Uh, and, and it's certainly a far cry uh, from the cost of full neighborhood redevelopment investment, uh, like which is going on at uh, Baltimore's Harbor Point at this moment. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, I actually found that Baltimore was performing reasonably well with the tax preference. Uh, you know, if we if we then think about um, OZ in terms of the country's development economy, uh, three years of this policy has basically produced uh, one Hudson Yards development spread across uh, the country. Uh, and, and again, Baltimore's relative success is thanks to uh, this locally funded and dedicated government staff, uh, as well as a few sophisticated developers committed to community development uh, and a few mission driven financiers that are really kind of all bending over backwards uh, to leverage a tax preference um, that just wasn't well designed to spur development in distressed neighborhoods. Okay, so now I want to um, give you a little more of the West Baltimore story in detail. So the, the greatest benefit of the OZ policy is its ability to stimulate new investments, uh, new investment conversations rather, and put Baltimore uh, on the map for a new set of investors. Uh, so I documented over 50 funds that had connected with Baltimore City uh, and or individual businesses and projects. Uh, and as many as 80 projects uh, were exploring OZ uh, as a potential investment source. Uh, related to this new ecosystem, I found that OZ was creating a new organizing structure in which the local government engages in development. Uh, in Baltimore, development capacity included the creation of a development prospectus. Uh, this is a marketing document that the OZ coordinator pitched to developers, pitches to developers and investors. Uh, 
And at the state level, this capacity um, included an interactive website portal where OZ actors and, and other investors uh, can locate projects, information, uh, and contacts about the state's uh, OZ activity. Um, however, while I found Baltimore City had made good faith efforts to track OZ development and connect communi communities to OZ through these coordinator positions, I also found that the policy was failing at oversight and engagement. Uh, and you know, study participants explained that OZ is a sufficiently complicated economic development tool that in addition to basic tracking, the policy requires federal funding for education, uh, for engagement, and probably for technical assistance. Um, and while OZ is stimulating these new conversations uh, and interest about investing in Baltimore, uh, this is actually not materializing into new outcomes for distressed neighborhoods. Uh, and I found several reasons that this was the case. Uh, the first is that most OZ investors demand market rate returns. So about 10 to 16% IRRs. Uh, and projects in distressed neighborhoods uh, like those in West Baltimore are likely to generate IRRs no higher than three to 6%. Um, the second is that OZ is just a weak incentive uh, that does not change development outcomes on its own. Um, of particular note here is that year and five uh, uh, that year five and year seven step up basis advantages of the program really were not enticing investors. Um, and OZ is really considered and used as a gap equity uh, source. Uh, it does not um, stimulate entirely new development. Uh, and I actually found government subsidy programs uh, and uh, federal new markets tax credits were uh, more important sources of capital to spur development. Uh, third, uh, OZ fails to incentivize investors and institutions already investing um, or interested in investing in West Baltimore uh, who do not have access to capital gains dollars. Uh, these include small businesses, uh, they include uh, developers, uh, they certainly include uh, community development financial institutions which are mainly debt driven uh, and were not eligible for equity based tax uh, preference. Um, but they also include kind of large institutional sources of capital uh, like university pension funds. Uh, then finally, I'll say OZ suffers from design failures. Uh, these include poor selection criteria, which basically force localities to select places like Port Covington uh, that don't require incentive, uh, failure to create or embrace a planning or market making process uh, that can prepare distressed neighborhoods uh, for future investment, uh, timing issues around capital deployment, uh, and I'd say really an inattention uh, to the relationship, um, the relationship between appraisals and other development criteria that are, you know, connected to the racist and segregationist practices that devalued these neighborhoods in the first place. Okay, so so all that said, uh, OZ requires some serious restructuring if it's going to stimulate meaningful investment in distressed neighborhoods. Uh, and I propose seven changes to the program or policy. Uh, this includes instituting reporting requirements and removing contiguous tracks and tracks that should not have qualified for OZ eligibility. Um, these are recommendations that have been made by other, you know, the other, the few other serious studies of OZ have made these re recommendations as well. And, and Congress really needs to stop delaying action in order to prevent uh, possible waste, fraud, or abuse, uh, and certainly to stop uh, the perception of it. Um, the next recommendations I make require deeper analysis. Uh, uh, they definitely uh, demand the convening of development policy and legal experts. Uh, they include federal grant support for education and engagement, um, uh, uh, deepening the step-up basis incentives uh, and aligning infrastructure investments, uh, as well as providing a federal guarantee pool to stimulate development in deeply distressed um, OZ tracks. Uh, I also recommend that Congress incentivize uh, CDFI bank lending capacity and add CDFI oversight to OC. Uh, and finally, and most importantly, uh, you know, uh, I recommend expanding or even substituting the OZ capital gains tax preference uh, to include a refundable tax credit for community-based actors that invest non-capital gains equity uh, into uh, deeply targeted distressed census tracts. Um, and in this note, you know, I'll say throughout this study, I repeatedly identified doctor and dentist dollars, um, individual businesses, uh, and small developers that were emotionally connected to West Baltimore. Um, 
And I also identified larger capital sources, again, like university pension funds that operate in and around distressed neighborhoods, but that often invest in primary or foreign capital markets. And now if these actors were given tax preference, they are much more likely to invest uh, patient capital in distressed neighborhoods uh, than these holders of capital gains dollars. Uh, and, and this is what I mean by um, the missed opportunity of OZ. Now that said, I, I think it would be silly to suggest those uh, recommendations or a refined OZ policy uh, offers the broader framework necessary for an equitable or a durable urban policy regime. Uh, so I thought it would be helpful to conclude this talk on that elusive question of what such an equitable urban policy regime would look like. Uh, and I think we're in a different moment than 2015, when again, basically all levels of government shrugged their shoulders to the uprising in Baltimore. Uh, and, and certainly the continued organizing around the pandemic, around racial equality have been critical to this window. Uh, and even setting aside the hostility of the Trump administration um, to urbanization, to poverty, uh, to non-whiteness, uh, this is also a break from the Obama era reliance on markets to solve intractable urban problems. You know, in just the last two weeks, uh, we've seen guaranteed support uh, of income for children. Uh, of course, that's gotten a lot of press, uh, but we've also less discussed is a commitment in the stimulus to CDFIs and minority deposit institutions. Uh, now, it may be the case that these policies are temporary, uh, but they may be openings after basically decades of congressional uh, and, administration, and administrational non-movement uh, on these issues. And, and we certainly have some good theories, ideas, and policies of what would make our cities more equitable. Uh, they include the just city analytics on how local planners can consider equity, diversity, and inclusion in local planning decisions. Uh, and they include, um, you know, challenges to liberal expansionism and the call for local public balance sheets. Um, but, but what we haven't been able to do is kind of pull these together into a comprehensive framework to build out a set of policies for the state. Uh, in fact, we, we really continue to retreat on this front. Uh, and, and I would say the most robust set of federal policies uh, are actually found in the concluding chapter of, of Patrick Sharkey's work uh, in which he proposes modeling federal policy, a federal policy agenda uh, through successful policies that confront joblessness and invest in children's environments. Um, so following that work, uh, thinking about the history of place-based policies uh, and, and through the conversations with community development experts during this study, uh, I'm just gonna end on some bullet points for a durable or equitable urban policy regime. Uh, so first, uh, tax policies like OZ are typically part of larger processes and programs that are cutting, uh, that are cutting federal redistribution uh, in this case, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of uh, 2017, uh, which had the primary purpose of reducing the corporate tax rate from 35 to 21%. Um, so like public housing and the mortgage interest deduction process before it, uh, we really continue to implement these programs in the face of larger federal policy that works against urban living, against, you know, against urban living and prosperity and against equality. Uh, and, 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 you know, it goes without saying that uh, immigration policy, labor policies, uh, education policies, um, that list goes on, labor policies, um, you know, policies that are not ex explicitly tied to place, uh, but shape how urbanization occurs, need to be better aligned with place-based policy. Uh, second, and that said, uh, we also know that, that those, you know, non-place-based policies, uh, even when they get the economy booming alone, do not solve our deepest urban problems, uh, you know, you know, even in the mid 1990s, when the entire American economy uh, was growing at impressive rates, uh, we know the joblessness for black men did not reverse. Uh, and, and we know repeated uh, uh, widespread unemployment remains a serious threat to the revitalization of urban neighborhoods. Uh, and at the same time, from HUD's Jobs Plus program to Milwaukee's New Hope initiative, we also have evidence uh, that if we saturate places with services and incentives to in to incentivize employment, uh, there can be substantial benefits to residents in areas of high distress. Um, and while we have less conclusive evidence, um, you know, theory and our understanding of development uh, also tells us that investing in children before they are six is when those investments are likely to be most effective. 
Um, third, I'd say equitable urban policy must continue to build on cross-departmental collaboration of the Obama administration's neighborhood revitalization programs, uh, like Choice Neighborhoods and the Promise Neighborhoods. Uh, these programs have shown good, if certainly underfunded examples of how we can make place-based initiatives less siloed, uh, more inclusive, and more efficient. Uh, fourth, uh, and this is a point that came up repeatedly in my interviews, um, economic development policy needs to be better tied to the wealth building process for the non-capital gains holding class. Um, Place-based policies need to be better integrated into large-scale initiatives for lower income pe people and build wealth through home ownership and business creation. And then fifth, I'd say is, um, you know, finally, if, if we're going to create an equitable urban policy regime, that only is going to exist if we can change the arguments. Uh, the first being we need to finally kind of eschew the notion that moving large numbers of families out of disadvantaged neighborhoods can or should be uh, the solution to concentrated poverty. Uh, people should certainly have the freedom to move out of violent, uh, segregated, and poor neighborhoods, uh, but they, sh they should also have the freedom to move up in place in these neighborhoods. Um, likewise, uh, I suppose a little convenient of me, I, I think we need to elevate uh, findings that tax preferences like OZ to date have largely benefited that capital holding class. Um, and the intellectual community here needs to better put forward the facts on these policies and programs and push back against kind of the think tank cheerleaders in DC that continue to implement them. Um, you know, we need to better convey that the free market approach to redeveloping poor places that we have now tried for 40 years has now failed. Um, and, we need to, and we need to also convey how impervious the logic is to begin with that private finance capital is the solution uh, to what is a complete and utter crisis in private finance capital in these neighborhoods. Um, and, and we need to also qualify the conclusion that direct investments like the war on poverty uh, and the federal EZ grants uh, suggest that government uh, investment, uh, direct government investment is definition, definitionally ineffective. Uh, I'd say a more accurate description is that in the grand scheme of the American economy uh, and in the grand scheme of the amount of capital uh, that it will take uh, to rebuild swaths of neighborhoods that have been redlined, that have been denied capital, uh, that have been incarcerated, uh, we have never seriously tried direct place-based investment. Uh, and moreover, um, where, you know, where our suburban communities have fared well, uh, that is thanks to enormous support from the federal government. Uh, and I think with this framework, and by changing these arguments, uh, we can then put forward place-based policies that are much more likely to succeed and much more likely aligned uh, with goals of equity and justice. Um, so, and because zone policies like OZ remain popular at the local level, uh, I think if more carefully constructed um, to benefit local residents, to uh, bring business creation and wealth, uh, and wealth building to the people in places that have been deeply disinvested uh, and to be more clearly aligned with equity and justice goals, um, uh, you know, zone-based investments can and should be part of this regi regime. So, uh, modeled after some of the more creative federal housing proposals we saw last year, uh, let me just propose that our next round of zones be spaces for reparations. Um, and here is just, this is just an illustration of how they might work. And again, the details would need to be taken up by uh, legal policy and economic development experts. Uh, but uh, imagine a, a scenario in which HUD would administer an RFP for a pilot reparation zones program. And cities would then submit at least two applications for a historically uh, redlined or segregated uh, set of census tracts that are deeply distressed, uh, but also near institutional partners and with institutional commitments, uh, you know, as critical job anchors for development. Uh, localities would submit zones that are in need uh, and deeply distressed, but they would also submit those that are comparable uh, to set up a counterfactual comparison. Uh, once HUD then selected awards uh, for a subset of proposals, uh, we could have a selected set of pilot cities established, or maybe they build off uh, an existing land bank uh, to acquire abandoned or vacant property in historically redlined or segregated communities. Uh, and then Treasury, in partnership with HUD, could provide direct funds for restoring um, them, as well as providing business seed capital uh, to locate or launch uh, uh, investments. Uh, and these, these funds could be forgivable as long as entrepreneurs and homesteaders committed to um, say 10 years in the neighborhood, at which time they would be allowed to 
remove that patient capital uh, and sell their investments at full market value. You know, you can imagine these funds also provide uh, low interest loans for business expansion to incorporate community development financial institutions. Um, but here would be the kicker. Well, all the, the businesses and investors could be offered federal risk guarantee pools and refundable tax credits to invest in these zones. Uh, only residents and businesses with a history living or working in segregated and redlined communities uh, would be eligible for land bank properties or forgivable grant funding. Uh, so in summary, again, if we follow an equitable urban policy framework, uh, if we change the arguments, uh, there's no reason that the next round of zone-based uh, development uh, can't be aligned with goals of equity and justice uh, and can't be part of this equitable uh, urban policy regime. Uh, and so I think with that final illustration, and I stress it's, it's just an illustration, um, I will conclude this West Baltimore story. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michael, for your insightful and, and rich presentation. And thank you for sharing your work with us and giving us an overview that stretched from enterprise zones to opportunity zones and walking us through the benefits that OZs can present to areas of high distress, as well as um, highlighting the, the, their design feature, their design and the flaws. Um, I would like to open up the floor for questions um, from anyone uh, in the audience, um, as a as a reminder, you may you have two options. Either you could raise uh, use the raise your hand feature in Zoom, and we will call on you to unmute and ask your question directly, or you may also type your question in the chat. Um, and if uh, to to get you know to get us to get us rolling, I can uh, I can ask my question first. Um, I I really appreciate that you engaged us with your uh, methodology and the value of um, introducing qualitative research and, and open-ended interviews and in, um, in research that had mostly relied on uh, quantitative um, efforts in the past. So one question I had when you were presenting the findings of your interviews um, and research is, could, could you speak more to why uh, opportunity zones uh, in general do not sufficiently support local businesses, institutions, and developers that are already active in these distressed areas? Yeah, yeah, um, and, and I think that's one of the, 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 the key challenges with the policy as it is. Um, so the primary reason is that, again, as I said, the, the holders of capital gains represent just a pretty small segment of American society. Um, a lot of it is uh, Silicon Valley dollars. Uh, a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it's coastal market dollars. Uh, and, and yet at the same time, um, there's, there's no shortage of people I found in the Baltimore experience, both at the regional and the local level, um, that have access to capital. And they have access to capital that could, be, that could invest in some of these neighborhoods, whether that be debt uh, or whether that just be non-capital gains equity. Um, but what I found again and again was that uh, those folks just didn't happen to have capital gains dollars. Uh, and, and again, that's kind of why I ended up at, at the refundable tax credit. It's that if, if we want to spur capital, uh, a much more um, targeted and efficient way to do this would be to just target regular sources of equity that exist uh, and want to make investments in some of these neighborhoods. Does that answer? Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. We do have an answer. Uh, we do have a question in the chat uh, from Joe's Klein Rosenthal, and uh, it goes, um, great presentation and proposal. My question is about locating information on the local NYC investment through opportunity zones. Given that there is no federal requirements for detailed reporting and reporting is voluntary, how can we learn about the New York City use of opportunity zone tax breaks, such as Goldman Sachs' recent investment in Brooklyn appears to be OZ driven? How do we find out about that? Yeah, it's a great question and a great problem. Um, I, I think the answer is Congress needs to do something about this. I mean, I, I would call this the original sin of Opportunity Zones policy. Uh, if you look at the white paper that informed this policy, uh, they write several times that data collection was failed on our last round of uh, place-based economic development incentives. Uh, this is partially the process of a Republican administration using reconciliation to jam a tax bill uh, through the American system. Uh, but 
But that said, that was three years ago now, and there's plenty of space in the aftermath of that reconciliation bill uh, that reporting standards could and should have been put in place. Uh, and, and I really think, you know, you know, could localities establish that um, that uh, opportunity zones investments have to be declared? Possibly, possibly that's an option. But from a federalist standpoint, right, it puts them at a disadvantage from with other localities. Um, you have seen some states, uh, including the state of Maryland, has basically tried the uh, the carrots approach, where they've said we're going to add state level incentives in these same zones, but to get our state level incentives, we have a local reporting collection process. Um, but obviously, then you're just you know subsidizing some of these same developments even more. But it is one option at the local level to try to capture more data. Joe, I think you had a question. Yeah, I have a question about. Um, I really, uh, I thought it was really interesting. You were saying about what sort of why does this policy keep getting replicated besides the sort of uh, mixed results and, and pointing to this sort of whole think tank ecosystem that supports tax-based policy. But I was wondering if also in your interviews, if you identified, is there like any sort of real growth coalition or like coalition on the ground that also is supporting these policies? Like Absolutely. are developers and CDCs that you're talking to, do they also continue to support like Kind of tax-based policy like this or is everyone on the ground sort of like this isn't great we there's an opportunity cost and we would prefer a direct investment but this is what we have so we just work with it what was your sense of of whether yeah, it's so actually i think, yeah. I think the answer is yes and this is why they, these policies remain politically this is one reason these policies remain politically popular is they're popular at the local level too mayoral administrations tend to like them governors tend to like them uh, at the community level it gets a little more complicated but the general sentiment I'd say is the federal government has been so disengaged from a direct standpoint for 40 years now that localities will take whatever they can get. Uh, you know, so they're they're open to it. I mean, Baltimore established a OZ coordinator and took this policy very seriously. And as I said, you know, they've tried to make it work the best they can in spaces, and I think they've gotten a little equity in some projects uh, that are good stories. Um, that said if you if you you know go down a level i think there was broad excitement at first from local community coalitions uh and then when we saw that basically community development financial institutions which have you know long been the drivers of debt in the debt driven development in these neighborhoods and one of the few drivers of actually getting capital into these neighborhoods were basically boxed out of the program because debt was not incentivized and the equity was um, um and CDCs at the same point who are mainly engaged in affordable housing. Uh, this, 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 to be fair, this policy wasn't really intended for affordable housing, uh, but it certainly wasn't well aligned with LIHTC projects for a host of reasons. Uh, so kind of both those set of CDCs and CDFIs uh, pretty quickly kind of turned on the value uh, of, of the policy, you know, saying it's for people here, we've been doing the work. Again, we have other forms of capital in neighborhoods uh, that are already here, It'd be nice if OZ incentivized it. I have one more question on the reporting of. Um, I'm not really clear on how such you know such a large investment could go unreported, or I mean, are there like reasons for keeping it vague? Um. Good question. So yeah, I, I think there is. So so I'll so let me answer this first by saying, you know, I don't know if I think I documented all the activity in Baltimore City. Um, that said, I I know for a fact I missed hundreds, if not thousands, of OZ conversations that didn't develop into projects, right? With other missed opportunities, perhaps that for some reason the investments didn't take place, and there's no way to document them. Uh, I I think you're right. It would probably be hide uh, hard to hide. Um, some of the really large investments being made just because these are, are large um, transactions. Uh, but that said, I, I do think uh, there's nothing that stops somebody, um, you know, who, who is making a land, uh, is doing something, probably not a land hold because you do actually have to make an investment in these spaces, uh, but is doing something that may not be community desirable uh, and has the uh, no reason to publicly report this and no requirement to do so. so 
Um, you know, again, e even if that kind of corruption, fraud, waste, whatever we want to call it, isn't taking place, uh, and I think it probably is taking place in, in some small spaces, um, but even if it's not, uh, you know, these are, a lot of these communities have been disinvested in, they've, uh, they've been uh, vulnerable to poorly designed federal policies in the past, uh, and the idea that there aren't these protections in place uh, was very concerning. Anything else? Do we have any more questions from our participants? Okay, so I think we can, would you like to add anything, Michael, or? No, thanks so much for having me. This is a lot of fun and, and working through this research. So um, I, I hope it was preventable and I, I hope folks got something out of it. I, I know I got a lot thinking about how to put it, put it together. No, this was definitely very rich and beyond presentable. And we thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to join us here. And on behalf of everybody at GSAP, we're, we're so happy to see one of our own so close to finishing and, and sharing their work. Um, uh, so thank you again, Michael, for, for joining us here. And um, for all our other participants, please be sure to join us again next Tuesday for our, um, our next lit, lit lecture at 115 with Francesca Amon. Um, thank you and have a wonderful day.